Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to this Future Work Conference that is organised by SCALE. And uh, specifically, welcome to this session on transforming Singapore into a green finance hub. And also, especially a warm welcome to our audience online who are tuning in right now. Uh, I'm Wu Chunjie, or JJ Wu, as many of my colleagues will call me, from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. So I study global financial centres, I look at cities, and how cities are um, at once the, the brunt, bear the brunt of many of the problems we face in the world today, whether it is the pandemic, uh, climate change, but at the same time, cities and financial centres hold the key and many of the solutions that we need to face these challenges. So a caveat, I'm not an environmental scientist, I was trained as an economist and then in public policy and regulation. So my work is on policy. I'm going to move ahead. Is this on? Okay, so before we begin, this is the QR code for Slido for our discussions later. So those of you who haven't, you can uh, scan this QR code, log in, and later we'll collect your questions and we can have a bit of a discussion at the end of this session. Now, I'm going to start with a little bit of bad news and then some good news. And I promise I'll end with some great news. So the bad news is that climate change is going to affect the global economy very badly. Uh, some of these projections that we see, it will reduce global growth by 23 trillion US dollars, according to Swiss Re. According to Deloitte, it will reduce the global economy by US 178 trillion dollars over the next 50 years. For cities, places like Singapore, we are going to see a much hotter, much wetter reality. Uh, I hate to say this, we are already very hot and humid right now, but it is, we are expecting it to get a little bit worse. But for the financial system, it is clear that climate change is going to pose a very unique set of risk that we may not be well prepared for right now. And certainly, this is an example of uh, something I pulled off the US Federal Reserve. On the left are the impacts of climate change, the things that will come about because of climate change, climate hazards. Uh, but on the right, you should uh, pay attention to are the vulnerabilities that we face in terms of leverage, borrowing, asset valuation, and I'm going to go a little bit deeper into some of this. When we think about the impacts of climate change on the financial system, there are really two types. And the first are the physical risks. We know that adverse weather events, flooding, earthquakes, whatever it is, creates some kind of a physical damage. And for the insurance companies, insurance sector, the claims, the costs are going to be very high. Disruptions to businesses, bankruptcies, defaults, and as you can see, many of the disasters that we've experienced so far have given rise to huge physical costs to cities. Now we know that when we live in cities, we live in close proximity, density. When you see a flood in the city, high value uh, assets are destroyed, much more so in the city with its infrastructure. But there is a more important risk that is going on, and there is a transition risk. Now, many economies are shifting towards a greener model, and uh, inevitable, there's huge policy push for this. But as governments shift our societies towards a greener economy, there's going to be shifts in the ways that we do business, and these things are costly. We want to decarbonize, but certainly efforts to decarbonize will incur costs, new infrastructure, new technology, what have you. And the changes in consumer sentiments, the desire for greener products, more sustainable products, a new different generation of consumers, it's going to give rise to more costs for businesses. So we think about market uh, disruptions, we think about all these fundamental changes in, a, in the way we need to do business, even as we cater for our environment. And certainly, climate risks are not exactly accurately priced. Now, there are many cities in the US, the mayors, they apologize. This is a, a once in 50 years flood. Then three weeks later, there's another once in 50 year flood. Doesn't make sense anymore. And the reality about climate change is that the risk increase exponentially. We don't know how severe the situation is. And the time frame, we're not sure either. Once in 50 years, it may well be once in 20 years right now. <coughs> So th that was, in a nutshell, the really bad news, and uh, this, this is bad news we need to be aware of because this is our future. Uh, some good news, there, is, there are efforts to address climate change. And I know at a global level, uh, Paris Accord, uh, court meetings, they do not seem to be moving the needle as quickly as we need to. In fact, projections show that our 
global temperatures are going to go up regardless of what we do. Even if we put a full effort to combating climate change, we can reduce all carbon emissions today. Temperatures will still go up by more than one degree. If we do nothing, it will go up by three degrees. Uh, it may sound like a very little, but the difference in two degrees can cause our ice caps to melt faster. Flooding for a place like Singapore is extremely dis uh, disastrous. So according to the UNEP, there is a huge global climate finance gap, $4.1 trillion, probably increasing even as we speak right now. But current investments in nature-based solutions are about US $133 billion, a drop in the ocean. And where is this money going to come from? We realize that at the international level, multilateral cooperation is a little bit slow. Sometimes it is stalled, to put it a bit bluntly. But I think green finance is a way where you can channel money, funding, where capital is abundant in the financial sector to where it is most needed. And our own MAS Managing Director, very quite recently, last year, he said the future of capital is green. And this is the strategy that we have taken as, as a global financial center. We are going to be a green financial center. There's no other alternative to this. And he says there are three powerful forces driving this. We need to recognize climate change for the disruptions that it will bring. The advances in technology and sustainable investing that we have right now and changing investor preferences. So the blunt reality also is that investors increasingly want to invest in sustainable products and also reap a return from the products. It's a tall order, I know. So there is some reallocation of finance. But what exactly is green finance? It is really, well, to put it very broadly, it is a structured financial activity that is supposed to create some better environmental outcome. But the reality is that right now, even as we speak, we're not entirely clear what green finance is. We know that green bonds, the green mortgages, and beyond that, really the sky's the limit. We haven't explored fully how we can make all our financial instruments green. <clears throat> and green finance is important because it plays several important roles. First, it, we can reduce the impacts of climate change on financial markets. This is a bit of a more self-serving kind of role. Some of the risks I mentioned earlier on to the financial system. If we are able to incorporate ESG into our financial tools, at least we can anticipate some of the disruptions to the financial sector, which would cause further disruption to the economy. But we need to cast our eyes beyond that, protecting the financial sector or the economy. We need to think about how green finance can help to support green technologies and solutions and how we can also help investors derive financial returns. Now, both are equally important. If there are no returns to be reaped from green financial instruments, nobody's going to put their life savings and their money. And without that pool of capital, nothing is going into the solutions. So the solutions need money. We have money there, and we need to connect the two somehow using market mechanisms. So green bonds are the most popular variety of green finance today. They are financial loans designed for financing certain green projects. Uh, you can see that the market is about $1 trillion right now. It will probably keep going up. But policy making is important for transforming any financial center into a green financial center and also building a green bond market. And the most important role, the role that Singapore has played quite well so far, is really market building, price discovery. Now, we are doing that for green finance right now. I'll just talk a little bit about that later. But in past decades, we've been doing this arguably with other sectors, with asset management. In the past, when we wanted to build up a wealth management sector, we had to find ways to set benchmark rates for our products. And the government had to put out money in some of the fund managers. So this is something similar. If you have been catching up with the news, the government is issuing more sovereign green bonds, investing in more green bond issuers. Um, the, other two, um, the other two policy roles are quite, uh, quite standard, establishing regulations. We want to ensure that green finance really achieves the goals it achieves. There's no greenwashing. We don't want somebody to sell you a green bond and say that it's going to fund some, uh, a solar farm somewhere else. But really, it's not doing anything. So we don't want that either. But the last point, connecting markets to the city. We will, we will speak to that when, we give, when I talk about some examples of green bonds. But right now, Green finance is the one key between finance, which is floating in the cloud, and the city, the place that we live in, the place we travel, we drive to work, we send our kids to school. Previously, finance and the city seem to exist on separate planes. You know, the financial centers have high income inequality, capital is there, doesn't always go to where it's needed. 
But I think with green finance, we have a chance to connect the two, to finally connect finance with the city itself. <coughs> An example of, of building markets I want to mention is how we're issuing sovereign uh, green bonds, and we also have a green bond framework. Now, to contextualize what exactly a green bond is, I want to skip ahead first to the green bonds before we come back. Now, a green bond, there are a couple of examples. One is the one that was issued by CDL, uh, I think a year ago. And the idea was that they'll issue a bond, people, uh, investors will buy the bond, and the proceeds will be channeled to increasing, improving the efficiency of one of the office buildings that they own, a Republic Plaza. They're trying to reduce carbon intensity, energy intensity, and water intensity. And they said that the proceeds from future bonds will be invested in financing more retrofitting projects. So in a way, this is what I mean when I try to connect finance to the city with a green bond, a very simple, very rudimentary green bond at this point in time, money can be channeled from investors into improving some of our infrastructure, improving some of our buildings, uh, energy efficiency. Uh, there's another green bond that was uh, released a couple of years ago as well by DBS, and it really seeks to finance green buildings, sustainable transportation, renewable energy in the region, and also to, to retrofit some of DBS's assets. Uh, I didn't have time to include in the slide, I think you saw in the news, DBS also recently built an office building that is zero emission. So we cannot entirely rely on real estate um, players to really want to build green buildings, to retrofit, to improve their buildings, because there are costs involved. It hits the bottom line. And we want to incentivize funds and finance to move towards the city to improve this infrastructure. And so to go back, there are several things that we can do besides building markets. We need to think about establishing norms and regulations. Now, there's one thing that we've learned over the past few years, not just with green finance, but with fintech, with blockchain, with all these new sectors, that regulations uh, need to adapt. The way we regulate a bank, the way we regulate a green bond issuer, the way we regulate a green fintech, it's going to be quite different. We need to think about bespoke regulation. Previously, when we think about systemic risk, we think about stability, we get the banks to keep equity capital. Uh, that, that level of equity capital may not exactly be uh, applicable to fintechs who are much smaller, who are much more reliant on VC funding, a different business model, basically. But going backwards, going back to first principles, I think we need to develop a green finance taxonomy and to understand what are the different tools. We have green bonds, uh, that's great, but what else are there? What does green fintech mean? What is perhaps a green future or derivative? We need to enhance our environmental risk management practices. So as you'll see, we, we are facing a little bit of a conflict with understanding green finance. It's a dual facet approach. On one side, we want to protect the financial sector. We don't want it to collapse or to face risks from climate change. On the other hand, we want to grow all these financial tools, green finance tools. So the two goals that we're really trying to achieve uh, improving disclosures is quite important because well, we talked about greenwashing. We want firms to disclose, to be, to be encouraged to disclose the, the, the things. And lastly, fostering green finance solutions. So I wanted to highlight that MAS has been working on this project called Project Greenprint. Uh, I just came back from a conference, uh, Point Zero conference, that looked at sustainable financing. And we've been discussing this at the conference in various workshops. The idea is that we need to mobilize capital for green projects and to not do it just from the MAS perspective, but to draw on the financial industry and to also acquire data, climate relevant data. Now this is the trickiest part. Let's give you an example, <coughs> emissions data. We have scope one to scope three. Scope one data is very easy. We measure how much emission is emitted from a, a factory, a production process. But if you think about scope three, scope three data means that you want to measure all your business processes when your managers take a flight to Bangkok for a meeting, how much carbon has he emitted? Delivery truck drivers, the use of your data centers, technology. Now, if at this point in time, it is almost impossible to capture all scope three, scope three emissions data. But the goal is to really do that. We want to capture all that data, so price it correctly. Because the more we let th this mispricing of uh, climate change go on, the more that the economy is not, we're not prepared for the disruptions that we will face. We want to monitor our commitment to emissions and to quantify some of the abatement efforts. Now the difficulty about climate change decarbonization is that the costs we are going to face very quickly, 
But the benefits of abatement, of reducing carbon, we may not always see immediately. It may be in the long term, several generations down, sometimes not even measurable. How do you measure clean air? Reductions in air pollution, how do you measure that? So as I mentioned in the examples I talked about, green finance can really drive urban sustainability. It's not just about industries, it's about improving our cities, making our cities greener. We can fund developers and architects, encourage them to build buildings going forward. Now, we know developers, architects, they respond to certain incentives. We want to provide their funding. We don't want to leave it entirely to the free market. If we leave everything to the free market, the ESG considerations are not going to rank very highly. And broadly, we want to foster some kind of collective action between industries, government, NGOs. I, I think as you can see, the regulatory reform we're thinking about, MAS has been engaging with the private sector, with the financial services sector, for two real reasons. Now, one, because the data is all held in the private sector. A lot of data is out there. MAS is trying to get it, but it can't have all the data. A lot of it is collected by the private sector. And two, we do want them to take ownership of the regulations. When you have regulations that don't apply very well to the fintechs, then it's not going to work. Compliance is going to be low. <coughs> so there are several key challenges that I wanted to round up with. First, there are challenges in terms of greenwashing. How do we ensure that bond proceeds are earmarked for projects and they really go to things that are green and they don't get diverted somewhere else? How do we assess climate-related risk and returns? Um, this is especially difficult. As I mentioned, we don't know tomorrow's risk. A once-in-50-year flood, we can project that risk uh, as a once-in-50-year event. If it happens every 10 years, then we, the risk goes up by five times. Costs go up by five times. Um, measuring and reporting expected environmental impact. Even the benefits are not measurable. We can measure the public health outcomes of cleaner air. But it's a little bit more than that. Mental well-being, kids being able to go to school, participate in more outdoor activities, all these things are not really measurable. So they have real challenges. If we can't measure them, then we cannot pitch it to our clients. Then we have one less reason for them to invest in a green bond. I'm very pragmatic. <laughs> I, 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 honestly, in my mind, I just want people to buy the green bonds. I want the green bonds to be used to improve our decarbonization efforts. So that is one thing. <coughs> the lack of global standards. We have our, our own understanding. We have, we have trouble with that. But the world's understanding is also a bit murky. Uh, measuring savings from avoided emissions. Uh, some people underreport. Some people overreport. For whatever reasons, <laughs> we don't know. How do you regulate green bonds? And how do you establish codes of conduct for? issuers of green bonds. Right now, it's all a very new industry. And for data, I, want, I think I've emphasized data already, the quality, availability, comparability. Some people measure the reduction in emissions on a year-to-year -year basis, some on a quarterly basis. Some people exclude certain activities from the reductions. Some people report scope two, some people report scope one. So you get this data that doesn't, is, you're comparing apples with oranges, or, or half-eaten apples with full apples. We really don't know. And implementing it is going to be a problem. As I mentioned, the way that the data has been reported can be quite different. And reporting absolute reduction in greenhouse gases and reporting carbon intensity reduction. And the two, two companies, each one reporting one, will say that they're doing the same thing. We're, we're thinking of decarbonization. But the way we report, the way we measure it, is absolutely different. But the future necessarily needs to be green, no matter what we do. And for Singapore, we have uh, this existing strength as a global financial centre. We are already the only financial centre in Southeast Asia. Um, notwithstanding what's happening in Hong Kong and China, we are already the strongest contender in the region. I think we have the biggest chance of becoming a sustainable finance hub. If not us, then who will it be? But we have the largest capital pool here in Southeast Asia. We are also a catalyst for sustainable development tools. We do have the technological expertise as well. And the green finance sector can really be an engine of growth for us. Again, very pragmatic. I don't worry about, yes, it's good for the environment, but how can it drive GDP growth in Singapore going forward? And the great news that I'll end off with before we spend some time uh, discussing or with points, that well, you can, it, the class is either half full or half empty. The great news is that there's a race for scarce talent. A lot can be done. I think uh, we have been discussing about lifelong learning here in NUS all day. And I think there's scope for so much to be done, so many skills to be picked up. This is a booming, growing industry. 
this one alongside fintech and, and blockchain, whatever it is. But there are skills that need to be picked up. But of course, for the for Singapore right now, we are short of talent. Whether it is tech, whether it is sustainability, or even finance. So it depends how you look at it. There are opportunities, abundance, but uh, there are also constraints on our growth and a bottleneck. So I wanted to end this very brief, brief uh, talk here. And I was wondering if we could spend some time, raise any questions, comments. We can make this a conversation. Don't have to, you know, I don't want to be in front of a firing squad. So anyone want to share or ask any questions at this point in time? We're also collecting questions on Slido online. So some of these questions will pop up on the screen. So how does Green Investment Bond, a compliant company, generate profit? The only outcome for green investment is the benefit to the environment only. Okay, so it depends on how you structure the product. I think it is important for the company to make a profit because without a profit, there is no reason why they'll be in this business. And as I mentioned, green bonds, they must generate some kind of a return to the investor. There must be a coupon rate that is somewhat comparable that helps them to somewhat beat inflation if possible. But at the same time, help them to feel good that they're contributing to the environment. So for issuers, that coupon rate, that, that access to capital, these are things that are the profit. You have capital right now. I can use it to improve my buildings, reduce costs. So that's what CDL and DBS have done. That is a very simple example. I think we're exploring new financial tools. I'm not sure what other tools will pop up in the horizon. Many more will come out. But right now, I think that if we're able to generate those sustainable solutions, improve our energy consumption, the reduction in costs is also a way to, to improve bottom lines. What are existing attempts for these challenges? Now, I think I'm assuming these are the challenges that were highlighted at the end in terms of data. I think there are a lot of effort to measure climate change, to understand how, do, how climate change impacts economies. The, but these efforts are quite disparate. I think there's no global consensus. There are no efforts to, to join up at a global multilateral level. There are efforts, but these have been slow going. So I think it's down to the scientific community to first measure, to quantify, to give us that scientific basis. And then we move ahead with the solutions. And then we think about how to finance these solutions. So there's a lot of backroom engineering going on, financial engineering, and also sustainable solutions engineering. Now with green finance, is there any redesign of current jobs or new jobs available? How can we ensure reskilling for our employees? I think with sustainable economy with the green economy, many of the jobs we have today, they will take on a, more, a sustainable slant to it, a certain element. For an insurer, for an actuarer, you will need to understand climate change, you know, understand the cost of climate change. And then you put it into a model. The same for economists. You need to in, input all these new data into a model. And you need new models that are not linear in nature, that sometimes the impacts and costs are completely unpredictable. So for any kind of job function, I think a greater understanding of the impacts of climate change and also a, a greater comfort with uncertainty. We may think that our models are able to project and predict, but some, uh, we are often going to be surprised by, by events, by black swan events from climate change. So the uncertainty is something we need to be aware of. So we think about strategic management, we think about organizational learning, all these are important. An organization that learns, that adapts, is the one that can survive climate change and disruption. I always go back to this book I read several years ago by Nassim Taleb, Anti-Fragility. And I think in that book, there are some key gems of how we can build an anti-fragile organization, leadership, or even economy. What green reporting standards is Singapore adopting? <coughs> standards are still evolving with no global standard. Generally, Singapore is trying to adhere to whatever global standards are emerging, whether it's from COP, from the Paris Accord. So we are adhering to the Paris Agreement in re reducing our emissions. So we want to reduce our, our emissions by the same amount. So in general, we, we are not a standard setter because the world has to set its own standards in consensus with all the countries involved. So we try to abide with many of them. And there are many international regulations in place. How do we select the right one? This is a truly difficult, difficult question. I think we need to assess for ourselves, do a bit of a cost-benefit. 
which are the ones that are not overly onerous, but they will help us to move our trajectory towards a zero emission future. To be kiasu, I would say that we, we adopt as many as we can, but <laughs> we, we need to be conscious of our colleagues in the government, in the public service, and how they have to deal with all this disclosure and all this compliance costs. So I think we, we have to take a measured approach. We take the ones that will achieve our goals of zero emission, and then we try to abide by them. But you know, international standards, abiding by them, it is more than just a green economy, a sustainability issue. It is also a commitment issue. It's a diplomatic issue. We're committing to global efforts, being a global citizen. So for the reputation of Singapore, there is, it is important as well. What makes a job green? <clears throat> they completely new roles. Or jobs with people who experience. I think green jobs is very complicated. There are some companies that provide green solutions. So those are obviously green, green jobs. But then I think ESG concerns will impact all our companies. So every job will have some green element to it. it can be half green, can be light green. I think that is going to be the reality for us. ESG is going to factor all of us. <coughs> Anything that any can do to bridge the talent gap in sustainability. New MSc in green finance is a good point. And it's full time, which isn't for working people. I think my colleagues from Scale are going to give you a lot of brochures, a lot of PDFs, and, and, and a lot of information on the websites. Beyond MSc, I think the future, I think we have. I think there's a consensus that the future of reskilling, retooling goes beyond a degree program or a master's program. We need to think about scalable programs, modular training, to be able to get a grasp of sustainable finance or sustainable development. It's not a matter of going away for one year to do a master's degree. It, it may not help anymore. So coming back constantly for retooling and reskilling, I think will be quite important. And this is why we have the festival today to discuss all these opportunities to build up these skills for future economies. How can green finance products be structured to better attract the consumer investor on the street? Um, this, <laughs> well, we are in this transition phase, not just with green finance, but with digital finance, with fintech. We want to, first of all, protect the consumers. We want to first think about corporate finance, merchant finance, offshore financing, before we start to include retail financing. I think for the men on the street, we need to simplify the product. A green bond or the government's sovereign green bond is about as simple as it gets. You invest your money, the government will take this money to build green infrastructure. They'll return you the money after one year, three years with a coupon rate. It is essentially a bond. So I think this is the reason why green bonds is a, a bit of a low hanging fruit for the financial sector. Consumers understand how it works. It's very easy to structure a green bond very low risk, and you know what to do with it. The other fancier products that will no doubt come about, I think they will not be for consumers yet, until a later point in time. And maybe this is an opportunity for Singapore to take leadership. I totally wholeheartedly agree. We are at an inflection point. We are at a point where we have already started to take leadership uh, in green financing, in ESG. Some say that we are a small country, we are a small city state, but we have done a lot more. <laughs> than what many other countries have committed to. The way that we have moved with our Green Plan 2030, our reduction of emissions, re removing petrol cam uh, cars from the roads. This is something that is almost unimaginable in many other countries. And I think we take the lead not just by trying to lead the conversation, but we lead by example of what we do internally. So fostering the green bond market, the government issuing its sovereign green bonds, is also a, a form of leading by example. If you want the industries to put their money where their mouth is, well, we, the government has to do it first. And it has. It has pushed out its own bonds. Which GFCs are leading in this green space in today's context? And how can Singapore learn from them? Now, this is an interesting question. Now, Singapore is one of those financial centres that occupy top rankings in both regular financial centres and green financial centres. Now, the two indexes, if you believe in these indexes, they don't overlap. So for example, Hong Kong is not exactly a, a top green financial centre, but it is a top global financial centre still. Uh, the same could be said of Seoul. But when you look at green financial centres, you start to see other cities, uh, Copenhagen, Frankfurt, some of the European financial centres really popping up. Whereas you see global financial centres, you see the, the, some of the Asian financial centres. So I think there is a lot to be learned from both. Now Singapore, we are playing a little bit of a tricky balance. 
We want to retain our global financial center status, top banking and finance center in the region. We should not let that go. Uh, I once I've been conducting interviews with the financial sector, and the consensus is to be a top Asian financial center. It is a, a race that is ours to lose. We we cannot lose this race. We must really mess up to lose it. We are already there. We are moving forward with that. But green finance is something we can learn from cities that are more sustainable than us. They have more tools and solutions in place. There's a lot to learn from them. I think that while there's a lot to learn, the constraints we face are quite different from them as well. So we are in a different part of the world. We have a different kind of landmass. I'd like to say when I talk to green finance advocates from Europe, you can talk about Copenhagen or Zurich or Amsterdam, but you know we are the only city state that is so small in the world. There's a limit to what we can do with our land. You can find a lot of solar farms all across the Netherlands, but we don't have that kind of space. So I think it's important to pick and choose the lessons to be learned and choose the important ones. How's the local startup space doing in terms of green finance? I think the momentum is growing. The MAS is opening a green finance hub in the city, a co-working space, there'll be incentives for startups, a little bit like an accelerator. So as I mentioned, often the government has to be the one to really push the sector. Nobody else has the expertise or the resources to really build the market. And the private sector wouldn't be incentivized by themselves. So we need to empower them. It is growing, no doubt. It is still very new, very, very, very new at this point in time. And the question of IoT, which I must profess that I'm not really an expert on IoT, in solving the challenge on data. IoT allows us to collect a lot of data. It allows us to optimize the way we live, the way we organize our homes, the way we build smart homes. Uh, but the challenge, of course, always is not about how to collect the data, but how do we process the data, how do we make sense of the data, and make decisions, make decision nodes based on the data, and then how do we take that data and make it understandable for the public. And with green finance, when we took a green bond, we developed green bonds, it was completely understandable to the public. But a lot of the data on climate change is not exactly understandable. So simplifying it to the man on the street, I think is quite important. One of the ways we've done it successfully, and many countries have done this, is with our electricity bill. Everyone knows, we look at our electricity bill, we see our electricity consumption of our neighborhood, then we feel a bit self-conscious or you know, competitive. Hey, this guy using less electricity than me. Why like that? I must cut down also. So that speaks to the human nature. We need to think about data that speaks to our human nature and then you direct the human nature towards the goals we want them to achieve. Could be ret reduction in water consumption, green finance, whatever it is. So data is important, but using it, simplifying it, it will be quite critical, I think. A question on reducing emissions and decarbonization. Is it the best and only way? I think it is the, well, it's not a bad way. It's about the only way we can, we can do it in a large enough scale right now. So very critically, we know that emissions is something that has caused a lot of the problems we're facing. Of course, we can think of more ambitious ways, reforestation, but that requires a lot more costs, a lot more cons uh, consensus globally. How can we convince some countries in the world to stop deforestation and in fact to replant the forest there? It's going to take a lot of time. So as always with climate change, we are facing so much global constraint. We go for the low-hanging fruit. First, we cut the emissions first. Then we worry about putting back the things that we have taken away from nature. Is carbon capture being examined as a solution? It, it is being pilot tested on Jurong Island. We're trying to capture some of the carbon from the production facilities there. Then we're trying to decarbonize Jurong Island. So we move by establishing pilot projects. We do what we can. Then we see whether we can scale up. How can those with no finance background equip themselves with understanding to fund, invest, evaluate, guide sustainability projects versus being greenwashed? Now, it is true that the financial services sector has become extremely complex over the past few years. It's not just about structuring bonds or mortgages or, or loans anymore. Um, green finance is going to become a lot like the rest of regular finance. The financial tools are going to become more complex and worst of all, it's going to be tied in with fintech and blockchain, and maybe to a certain extent, cryptocurrency. So I found in my conversations that there is growing interest in using the blockchain to drive decarbonization. I can see the benefits 
it is transparent, it is automated, you can, ex you can tokenize carbon and treat it accordingly. So there are benefits there. But to, for those of us trying to get into the space, and that includes me, <laughs> it's going to be very difficult. I, I cannot code I, for those to save my life. And I think many of us are the in the same boat. And to understand the fancy financial models, it's going to be difficult. I would say one step at a time. Pick up some coding, pick up some basic financial analysis, look into the CFA syllabus. There are many things to pick up, but as the saying goes, th there's only one way to eat a whale, bite by bite. You have to do it step by step. And that's why the modular approach to education is quite important. We want to train ourselves year on year, uh, quarter by quarter, and try not to front load everything right now because things are changing. What is the name of the ESG Green Finance Accelerator? I think that's the one by MAS. It has not been released. The name has not been released yet. So I think you will watch that space. It is clear that the finance industry must adopt a different mindset and metrics. What key metrics can be adopted? Now, the financial sector, the financial industry has been having a bad name since 2008. And we need to think about all the metrics that involve ESG, financial inclusion, climate change um, measures such as emissions, decarbonization. So some of these metrics need to be incorporated into some of our tools. But we all, again, we strike a balance between the free market and overly intervening. So we can encourage, we can provide incentives, we can get financiers to in include some of the emissions data. Is this a truly green product? We can rank them, we can provide consumers with the understanding that if you invest in this thing, it will be more green. If you invest in that other company, oh, that's, that's a, a dirty bond. So we can provide the kind of a framework data. We can't force the companies to adopt it. So that, that will be something that we can think about. And some of these key metrics are being developed right now, even as we speak. So the more we encounter climate change, the more we understand it, the more metrics will pop up. And I think we need to, it goes hand in hand with technology, with artificial intelligence, in collecting this data, making sense of it. How do green bonds returns compared to non-green bonds currently? Wow, I'm not up to date with the latest coupon rates. But I would say it is not, not that far apart. It is increasingly comparable. It proves to us that there's a way to structure a financial product that can give returns and that can be directed to sustainable solutions. So I, I take that as a very positive point. And well, I tend to go for the lower bar as long as a green bond can help the consumer to beat inflation not such a low bar today in today's climate. But if that can help consumers to beat inflation, contribute to green sustainable solutions, I think that in itself is something that will be quite helpful right now. I think we managed to churn through all the questions. Any any questions on the floor also or, or comments, sharings from your experience? have a couple of minutes. Any thoughts that came out from the presentation or some of the fellow questions that popped up on Slido? The greatest challenge in green finance would be getting consumers to invest in larger amounts and not just, right now we're pitching to, as you mentioned, a small subset. 
most consumers in the financial sector are looking at interest rates, return rates. So if the difference was maybe half a percentage point, one percent, maybe still palatable, acceptable. But if you're telling consumers to give up 1.5% of returns for a sustainable solution, it's convincing them that the returns will come collectively, society will benefit. You're paying 1.5%, a little bit like a tax for the future. Convincing them, reframing the argument for them will be quite difficult. Because for issuers of green bonds, they will also be trying to pitch to consumers in terms of returns first, and maybe a bit of the feel-good factor. I think a broader shift in narrative that you forsake some returns, but the returns come back in a better environment for our kids to live in. Yeah, it's hard to understand for everyone. I, I can accept that because the financial sector operates on its own logic. People invest in things for pure profit and returns. So reshaping the narrative is important and getting the financial sector to partner us to do it is also important. So messaging, advertisements, after a while you feel that people, um, you know, they absorb this very naturally. Then they'll start assessing, would, would this help the environment more? Maybe it'll attract them to invest. But you're right, there must be a baseline level of return to attract them. If the deviation is too large, then they may not. Sorry, uh, so if, if I may respond to that as, as just a, a layman investor, right? I, I think that for a green bond or good finance to succeed at the retail level, number one, I think the first bar that it should beat is, of course, inflation, right? And having beat inflation, you can also not expect, or you should not expect that the average investor would have to sacrifice too much. And if you ask me, my sense is less than 1%. If you expect more than 1%, I think your average investor would shy away from it, right? So, so, so that would be my uh, candid, intuitive uh, uh, response. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, that's my, my, my thought and comment. Oh, absolutely, I agree. And I think the market genuinely agrees with that assessment as well. So at this point, it's still price discovery. You want to see what's the threshold. How much will investors be able to accept? So I think that is for the market to grow. And going forward, whether some of these green fintechs, sustainable solutions firms are profitable as well. If they can generate above normal profits, then there's something there. There's something else we can think about. And a bit controversial, but having more complex financial instruments, green financial instruments, it, that may help. It can uh, will provide for other needs of the investors. Now, pre-2008, I think it was something that was going on. You merge insurance with investing, all these things. And so the people thought of investment as a package. I get this, I get some coverage, I invest in this. Uh, it's not fashionable to say that right now, after 2008. But I think there is some some benefits to merging some different functions of finance, not just a return and then the sustainable part, but maybe the tools that we can consider that can provide returns in other ways. So something to consider, but I think that will depend on how we regulate the industry going forward. So I think we're left with a couple of minutes. Any last thoughts before we... Ah, okay, very quickly. How is government regulation evolving since climate change? It's a classic example of market failure. Ah, this is true. Climate change is a market failure, a failure to price <laughs> climate change correctly, a failure to come up with solutions, and a ch failure to understand different time frames. We want to reap the benefits today, but the costs will come very far in the future. So regulation is trying, well, in terms of regulation, regulation is necessarily reactive. We want to first ensure that the, the financial markets are stable, they're safe, and we want to promote these fi uh, green finance tools. So for Singapore, the MAS plays a dual role. It wants to grow, grow the market. It also regulates the market. It is a bit unusual. Not all regulators behave like that. They have been doing that for the past few decades. So I think a more proactive approach to regulation that identifies emerging sectors and not just reacting to emerging risk, that will help. For non-profit, I'll take this as the last question. Non-profit green initiatives, which need funding, what are the possible financing op opportunities? Wow, this is a difficult one because we haven't established that framework in Singapore yet. There's, there's going to be demand. 
But the problem is that the non-profit green initiatives are still extremely nascent, very nascent. You find most of the non-profit sector focused on social welfare, the needs of the poor, uh, environmental degradation, yes. But the financing for these uh, non-profits, I think is something we need to explore very carefully. In terms of non-profits, they're different from what we've been talking about with green finance. Green finance has a very standard model. It's a little bit of VC, it's bo uh, bonds, it's financing, but this requires more effort from the social sector, donations from the public. So it's a much bigger issue that is maybe outside of green finance. I think if there are no further questions, I will bring this session to a close and I thank everyone for your attention, for your questions. I, I really enjoyed the questions, so thank you very much everyone. <laughs>